Good afternoon, everybody. Um, absolute pleasure to have you here today um, in the annual roundtable discussion of the Emerging Venture Markets State of MENA funding. Um, I hope you're all keeping well and healthy. Uh, it is a pleasure to be able to share some of the insights from our report that we've recently published. Now that we're covering um, Africa, Middle East, Pakistan, Turkey, uh, today's discussion is to kind of deep dive into the insights that we pulled out from the report. And really, I'm honored to have four panelists that will be joining us today. Dina Shanofi, Chief Investment Officer of Flat6 Labs, Basil Muftah, General Partner of Global Ventures, Atif Awan, uh, Founder and Managing Partner of Indus Valley Capital, um, Amal Dahan, who's the partner of 500 Global, based in Saudi. Um, to get their insights, each of which are coming from different type of angles, to, to really dig into the numbers and the data. The way that we're going to structure uh, the conversation today, we have an hour. I'm going to spend five to 10 minutes providing a, a high level overview of some of the numbers, data points from the report, how things can contextualize for our conversation. I will then proceed to have a 30 to 40 minute discussion with the panelists and then deep dive into any Q&A that you may have. So if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat discussion and we will be sure to get to them. Just in terms of context, again, for any of you that are new to Magnet, our uh, platform is the data platform for emerging venture markets, which we now categorize as Middle East, Africa, Pakistan, and Turkey. As we continue to develop and grow, we will add geographies specifically focused, not in emerging markets, because many of these geographies are developed markets, but emerging venture markets. And why is that? Because how can you benchmark some of the trends that you're seeing in these markets to much more developed markets like the US and Europe? We want to be able to benchmark them to geographies that are somewhat similar. With that said, you can see that for anyone that, and all of you who no doubt is following the global trends, um, I'm an active listener of All in VC, which I find fascinating to understand the activity in the US. The trends that you see in the US, Europe, are being replicated now in this market of urging venture markets. A record year across all of these geographies for capital deployment and number of transactions. And I think that's extremely key as the uh, backdrop of the conversation for 2021. Again, 2020, for those that can go back, can remember that it was a year of two halves. The first half, really the trickle down effect of 2019 being big deals that happened in Q1. The second half of the year, really seeing the unpack, impact of the onset of the pandemic. 2021, though, saw some significant growth. And here, what we tried to do is really put it into the global context. And what you can see is that really MENA and Africa, while seeing this considerable growth, still has room for development when compared to Latin America, which has almost been double the size of that which we've seen, Asia, and, and even the US markets. So really huge room for exponential growth. But what we have seen, and this categorizes aggregating each of these geographies put together, is a tripling of the amount of capital that has gone into these emerging venture markets, despite only a 30% increase in the number of transactions. One of the thematics that no doubt we will continue to discuss is that really this year was the emergence of these mega deals. Um, mega deals being constituted as deals greater than $100 million of investment. And in fact, when you look at all of the geographies that we track, 2021 saw the same number of mega deals as the last five years combined. And this was reflected in the actual deal flow. So for the first time, we saw this drop in, not for the first time, we saw an increase in late stage deals, um, almost 10% increase uh, for the later stage deal activity, while a considerable drop of about 7% in early stage investment. One of the things that I would like to touch on um, with the panelists is, is that a red flag and something to be concerned about as we continue to see this increased activity? But when we look into each of the regions, Number one is that each of the geographies saw more deals in 2021 than we did in 2020. Some at a higher pace of growth, you can see in Pakistan, even in Turkey, compared to others where it's slightly more marginal, but each geography did see increased number of transactions. However, on average, it was a 3.5X increase in capital deployment. 
some geographies again more than others, but across the board, you did see this considerable increase in activity in each of these geographies. And when you start benchmarking specific geographies, there are certain stories to be said. Turkey had a standout year in terms of investment activity. Um, they had a record number of transactions and total uh, deployment in Turkey, driven by some huge mega deals, really was the standout story in Turkey. Whereas UAE, Egypt, and Saudi, albeit the next three that came in line, has seen the gap between the UAE and Saudi Arabia drop from 40 deals the year before to now only about uh, 14 deals. And now you look at the other geographies that are coming from Africa, also coming into the foray with investment activity in Nigeria, for instance, one of the leading ecosystems out of Africa, seeing considerable growth. And Pakistan has really seen this emergence onto the, the, the landscape, both seventh in terms of total number of transactions and total capital deployment, with each of these geographies in the top three seeing mega deals for the first time taking place um, in, in each of them uh, to drive the ecosystem's growth. When you talk about industries across all of the uh, geographies that we're looking at, fintech is the standout story. Fintech is the industry that's seen the most activity in terms of industries. Last year, the story was around education, healthcare, e-commerce, but now fintech has really led the way in terms of total number of transactions and the same in terms of specific capital that was being deployed within the geographies that we're now covering. And when we talk about these mega deals, you can see that the top 10 deals, each of which have accounted for more than $100 million in terms of transaction, accounted for about 40% of the $6.9 billion that was invested across all of the venture capital landscape in these markets. And another thing that I think is becoming interesting is here we see each of the uh, top 10 most active investors in the landscape. Um, many of whom are beginning to play in each of these geographies. And I think that's a story that we want to dig into. Is there now an emerging venture market mandate for some of these investors? And what is the drive towards more international players coming into the market uh, with interest and vigor? And finally, we'd be remiss not to talk about exits. In the markets that we've seen, a record number of transactions have been happening as liquidity events, for exit activity within each of these specific markets. And this is a story that we expect to continue, which was a slight drop in 2020 into 2021. So for anyone who's interested in any of the information and data, the report itself is free. Um, however, we have now published and will continue to publish deep dives into each of these geographies and the data itself is available uh, on the platform. So please do uh, contact us if you're interested. But now to the speakers themselves. So if I can ask you please to each put your uh, cameras and unmute. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure and it's great to see people coming from each of the geographies. Um, as I said, please do uh, keep the responses where you can concise, but at the same time, if you have views on other people's opinions, please do interject and jump in. To start off, I will ask um, Dina, Coming from Flat6 Labs, I mean, um, I'd love to get your opinion. Flat6 Labs obviously based historically out of Egypt with different accelerator programs across the region, uh, many of which are also in North Africa. But with the emergence of the data that we're presenting, historically, we have seen that MENA investors have not necessarily, even Africa, North Africa investors, considered South Sub-Saharan Africa as a market of growth. Has that changed in your opinion in recent years? And what do you see as the differences and opportunities with the Africa continent as a whole moving forwards? Thank you, Philip, so much. So I think the maybe the interest from investors definitely have so so I, okay, so two two sides to that story, right? There's the there's the founders and the company side, and then there's the investors from the perspective of the VC fund managers. And then there's actually a third perspective, which is the LPs and what they want to see. And, and I think the, the answer to that is slightly different and I'll be very concise for each of those three sort of parties. I think from a, from an, from a, from a founder's perspective, Sub-Saharan Africa has become a lot more interesting. And I, it's, it's a bit bizarre because I think there's always been a bit 
uh, a slight difference in perspective between Egyptian entrepreneurs and then the rest of North Africa. North, the rest of North Africa, Egypt aside, has always actually looked down to Sub-Saharan Africa, even with traditional businesses from before in terms of where to expand and seeing an opportunity. I think Egyptians are really starting ca to catch up. And it's actually seen within the culture at large that there's a, there's, a sub, there's a recognition of a lost opportunity. So I think from a founder's perspective, there's definitely that. I hear it a lot more. Um, also because of Egypt aside, most of the other North African markets are, are small. Um, as a market to address. And so a lot of them feel the pressure to expand a lot sooner than Egyptian founders. For us as fund managers, I think the pressure to, to look at Sub-Saharan Africa will be highly seen in the next, in the next year. And, I, and, I, and from, again, Bessel was speaking about rumors, but from what we hear, most of the second rounds of, of funds for, for Egyptian VCs would now actually be looking at Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think it's also partly arbitrage with valuations in Egypt coming up so much, there's a, there's a huge opportunity being in the early stages to invest in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this actually has also reflected as well in our LPs that see that this is a, a slightly more, a slightly less mature market that could do with a lot of, particularly for Flat6 Labs as the early stage investors that sometimes help create the pipeline for the larger ecosystem. There is a pressure to say, maybe that's the new place that you need to be. The pipeline is happening organically now, uh, more in Egypt and North Africa. And there's, there's a story to build, uh, to build further upon in Sub-Saharan. Um, so Thank yeah, you. I think definitely. So like Basil, I'm going to come on to you. I know that you're personally very passionate about Egypt, personally and professionally as well. Um, and we've seen Global being one of those active players who have made investments in Africa, Middle East, even in Pakistan and further afield. I mean, what's your take on the region as a whole in terms of an opportunity? Is your mandate now becoming wider and wider as you see these emerging market opportunities? And what role do you see Africa playing with regards to the growth of um, the region's investment activity. Uh, thanks. First of all, congratulations on your new report, and you know, love the fact that Magnet is expanding. We really appreciate all the support, Philip. You, you and you guys do. I know how hard this. Is. I know how hard it is to collect the information because we don't give you any, so I have no idea where you get it from. <laughs> but anyway, <Thank> you. Um, <laughs> joking aside, listen. There is nothing called Africa. First of all, there are multiple Africas, or let's stop talking about it as a as, as a country. It's not. It's multiple countries. So you have the Nigerias and the Kenyas, which and South Africa, which are kind of stand out. I'm talking about Sub-Saharan Africa for a second. Are, are standout countries, they have an ecosystem, they have size, they have scale. Nigerian companies are furiously coming into Egypt, by the way, I, you know, et cetera. Kenyan companies as well, and Egyptian companies are reciprocating, and there's going to be that. Then there's another Africa, which is Ghana, Uganda, Rwanda, you know, name a whole bunch of other smaller countries, which are still in the early stage where seed investment makes more sense and, and kind of accelerators, incubators, and so on. So that's the first distinction. There is nothing called Africa. There is a continent called Africa. Africa, but there are lots of different countries with different characteristics. Two, I'm personally very, very impressed with the quality of the technology that we've seen coming out of uh, Nigeria, in particular, Kenya, South Africa, and across the board. There's one of the largest e-pharma plays is coming out of Ghana, right? And, you know, one of the largest fintechs or a number of unicorns in Nigeria this year, much faster than we've seen even in the Gulf, which is, let's say, quote unquote, has more money to put behind startups. And yet Nigeria is able to attract, build businesses. And you've seen the announcements on, you know, the OPEs and the flutter waves, et cetera. Um, I think there's our, you know, our strategy revolves something called PEN, which is kind of Pakistan, Egypt, Nigeria. We see a lot of similarities across these three markets, both in terms of size of population, size of opportunity, the the the, the number of people who are unbanked, um, under delivered on healthcare, supply chain issues. I mean, you name it, you, there's an opportunity, and international investors, and this is the key part are looking for what Dina was talking about, arbitrage, right? So you've seen Kleiner Perkins and others, and Atif, I'll leave that part to you, come into Pakistan quite aggressively and, and, and do some interesting moves. We've seen a number of international investors, Tiger, GA, and others starting to look at Egypt. And then I don't need to talk to you about Nigeria and how much is going on over there. Like everybody has come into Nigeria in, in the past year. The point being though, if local VCs like us and startups for that matter are going to compete 
then scale is going to be the name of the game this year uh, in, in my mind, right? So we will continue. I think you made the point in your presentation to see some mega rounds. Companies that have been around four or five years are going to have to raise the, the large sizes to be able to compete. Um, yes, there's a lot to do at the early stage seats. I don't want the you know, new entrepreneurs to be disheartened. They'll find money, they'll find opportunity, but there will be a lot of attention paid to who can get scale, not just as a, in, in their country, but potentially across those, those two or three geographies that I mentioned earlier. Thank you. And actually, I'm going to touch on that point um, with Amal. So, I mean, obviously 500 interested in the region, they have been famous for having multiple funds in multiple geographies. In fact, they're one of the first to show the book blueprint of the multiple funds for each of the geographies. So it'll be interesting to take, um, are they doubling down in this emerging venture market region of Africa, Pakistan, Turkey, Middle East? And the second one is to touch on the point actually, because I think it's an important one and, and maybe Dina as well, uh, before I move to Artif. One of the, the red flags that I wrote about last year is a concern of a drop in early stage deals um, in specifically accelerator programs. And I know that in Saudi Arabia, there's the Sanabal 500 program. I know that for Plastics Labs, historically has always been focused on the accelerator program. Having said that, there is a stark drop in that level of activity. Is that something that is temporary because of the uh, pandemic and the ability to operate in those things? Is there a concern that needs to be raised to governments and investors alike? Or is there increased activity at the angel space, which is just so hard to capture that is covering the early stage ticket that now we're seeing VCs graduating to slightly larger ticket sizes? Um, Amal, from your perspective and the activity that's happening specifically in Saudi and the wider region, but then also Dina, if you have any views on that. Definitely. So there's two points, but I also want to thank you again for the report. It's been really a North Star for us and for so many, because we get asked a lot about the region and about the views and the numbers. And honestly, Magnet has been really what we refer to in interviews or even sending that. So really kudos on what you're doing. So we really appreciate it. And on the note, we don't provide enough data. I think we spoke about that earlier. So we should definitely do a better well, on job. The, on that. that point, this year, we're going to work on individual uh, investor participations and valuations. And, and I think we will start <laughs> actually putting things out there to, to see how we get more data. So, so watch the space on that. But yes, thank you. We'll be watching out for that. Definitely. So, so one thing I think about, you know, 500 Global in particular as, you know, the flagship and the company itself, you know, they started investing in African countries, you know, we're talking about 54 African countries here. So there's definitely the variation of it since 2013. So there's more than 70 investments already, you know, in African startups. Um, that has been done by 500 Global. So there's a look for obviously opportunities that are for rising stars, you know, that are working in their countries to bring these innovations to the rest of the world and scale through the global network of 500. Now, as for us in Sanabel, we do invest in uh, MENA. So North Africa is the mandate that we have alongside, you know, with the GCC, obviously. And do we see the opportunity? Are we going to continue? We definitely see the opportunity because we lead with seed and that has been 500 small toes is coming really early, working with the founder is cultivating and doubling down, you know, down, down the line. So 500 truly sees the opportunity, obviously, in, in the region. And, and that fund is actually something that represents that. And I assume that it will be also so many, you know, activities that are coming in the next period. Now, in the question of the accelerator part, you know, I think running the virtual piece of the accelerator was definitely a challenge for so many during the pandemic. And even the questions of the founders, am I going to get maybe the same value? Is it going to be the same? Would I get the visibility with the investors? Because at the end of the day, why would you do an accelerator? Because you want to create investable startups. You want to give them visibility to see more investment and see value in them. And if you come as the first check and Dina you know, would know so much about that, you suddenly give it structure, you know, and kind of credibility among other investors. We've run one cohort, you know, of that virtually. And then after that, we expanded the cohort in person here here in Riyadh. And I think it's, yes, definitely there was a challenge, you know, with the pandemic, you know, cross-border kind of bringing the companies and all of these stuff, but we still continue. And what I'm seeing is actually more accelerators that are coming to the region now and looking at the region, you know, as a potential pool that they can look at early stage companies. So yes, that increased activities, you know, at a later stage and investors looking into expanding funds there, but you do need pipeline. You do not the whole 
of uh, game, but they do play a role in creating and pollinating those startups uh, on it. So I do expect that we will need, yes, more. Uh, and I would see more accelerator programs actually coming to the region in that. And I hand it to you, Dina, on that. Yeah, and Dina, I mean, specifically to the question, is it a red flag? Is, is this something that we should be concerned It's a about? huge issue. It's a huge issue. I don't know, Emil, if I agree with you, but I'll no, let no, Dina answer it first. Is, it is a, I'll tell you why it's an issue. I think it's an issue because all of the all the prior accelerators that we had in the market were very short term. They didn't have the longevity. They didn't establish an asset class. Um, and there were days in Plastics Labs life where it would have been so easy to go and, and, and get a $1 million check for a two, two cycle program um, that is, has no continuity. And then you have to struggle again to fundraise for the next two cycles. And, and so if you look at all the previous programs that existed in the market, that was the name of the game. They were very short lived. And so, the, and so they didn't have an investor mentality. And I think what we need to see more is not just about accelerator programs, but it's sustainable seed investments, accelerator program funds that are able to sort of look at it from a pure IRR perspective and are able to sort of create that institutional foundation to the grassroots movement on entrepreneurship generally. And, and, and I think that if, if I were to say, I think one of the success factors of Flat Exams is that we've resisted sort of being pulled in by the, by the easier money versus sort of establishing that 10 year longevity in a market to allow us to really focus on the portfolio. But it is an issue. Um, there is an issue in terms of, uh, in like sort of a lot of founders that now feel so much pressure to just keep bootstrapping and and then they struggle by the time they're they're sort of trying to raise a series A because then they've already sort of compromised their growth because they're strapped on cash. Um, a few months I'll go raise a mega deal immediately like some some examples we've seen um, and so there's a bit of a pull and a push in terms of availability and pipeline and then availability of of funding um I gotta I really, gotta jump in you're creating yes. a big problem though both both flat six labs and and, and, and 500 are creating <laughs> a huge problem in my mind no listen I really appreciate what, what I've seen coming out of the accelerators is much higher quality the filtering you guys do the training the development everything is so much better than it was two years ago. But mm -hmm. the reality is there aren't the dollars available to cover these startups. Let's just be very flat out about it. Because mm -hmm. if I take, what is it, 2.56 billion for the region, uh, your number uh, for Mina, uh, Philip, if I remember correctly, yep. plus or minus uh, a, a, few, a few million there. If I take out, if we take out um, 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 the mega deals like Kitopi and Unifonic, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And you actually look at what went into early stage. It isn't that much more than the year before. Mm -hmm. And yet there are so many more startups graduating and coming out higher quality. And the, 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 you know, the, the pressure is higher. I'm just saying, I love what you're doing. I love the work you guys are doing, but it is creating a problem in, in the well, area. I I agree with I'm you, but there is, there is an I'm issue and we know that in the fundraising, you know, and, but again, um, I do see the need of it and the need for more of those. And I agree with Dina, it's, you need those kind of long-term, you know, thing. Do we need to double down? Yes, there is, uh, definitely. Our angels are actually, you know, participating in that game, you know, early on. Yes, we see that, especially in Saudi Arabia, there's more money coming from angels, obviously, to the start. But what we're trying is to do, build those early bridges, you know, ahead of time and early on, and it will not be played obviously with only two accelerators, right? You will need more of that type and that caliber of accelerators that really focus on investment in the mindset and help the founders reach that. But our role never ends by the program. Our role continues, even if now we're talking to founders in series A and series B and they do still come back, you know, for connectivity and others. Definitely a, agree there is pressure, but leading it to you, Philip, to carry yeah, on. Yeah, cool. You know, Look, I, and I, 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 of course, I want to have Atif involved and I think this is a great segue. Number one, I think it's fascinating to see the growth of Pakistan and, and a year on from the conversations that we had last year, just to see what's happening there. I mean, before the call that we just had, um, everyone is interested. Every one of the panelists uh, mentioned the growth of the Pakistani ecosystem. I can speak to the fact 
that governments are fascinated by it, corporates are fascinated by it, founders are fascinated by the activity that's happening in Pakistan. And I can speak to the fact that in the groups that I'm in, the pack launch activity, the, the community that I've seen in Pakistan has not necessarily been seen in the same kind of emphasis and oomph as, as we've seen here in the MENA region. I mean, quickly to touch on the point of what they're saying, I have not seen too many accelerator programs in Pakistan. Do you face a similar challenge with early stage startups and pipeline? But number two, because I think it's, it's important for all of us to hear from you on what's happening in Pakistan, what really has been the catalyst in the last year and your view on what will happen in the year ahead with regards to the Pakistani ecosystem itself? Sure, thanks, Philip. So I actually have a term for this attack of the accelerators. This was gonna be one of my predictions for next year, uh, 2022. This is happening. I mean, and the YC model has been so successful. Now you have on deck coming in strongly. 500 Global has been really successful. Hyper is a new one and you'll have a lot of local variants. And I think it's a good thing for the ecosystem overall. Uh, you know, this is what drives future funding. So yes, today it might feel like there's not enough money. In future, it will be. Uh, um, in Pakistan, we've had a bunch of local accelerators, uh, you know, but YC has been doubling down and we expect to see a lot more higher quality accelerators um, uh, coming to Pakistan and also locally ones being created. Um, so, so jumping into Pakistan, you know, like it's been really uh, phenomenal uh, seeing how Pakistan ecosystem has grew so fast recently, but I want to take you back a few years. If you look at 2016 to 2018, Pakistan was averaging around $10 million in VC funding a year, while MENA was averaging $800 million, even 2016 to 2018. So if you use that as an index, it was like a one to 80 factor, right? And last year, Pakistan did close to 350 million, uh, which is uh, about one seventh to one eighth of MENA. So we closed a lot of that gap very quickly. And that's about what the GDP ratio is as well. But if you look at consumer spending ratio, it's actually actually one to five, you know, because a lot of the GDP in MENA comes from industries and oil uh, that's not necessarily monetizable by startups. So we expect that it's a lot more room uh, for growth. Uh, last year was, you know, more funding, um, we see funding in Pakistan than all the prior years combined. And there was a period of four weeks in which, you know, Pakistani startups raised more than they did in last four years. Uh, so it's a phenomenal exponential growth. And then what's even more exciting is you refer to the community element. So Pakistan has such a strong diaspora uh, locally, you know, it's just by virtue of being such a large fifth largest country and young population, there's a very engaged community forming around it. Uh, and then that diaspora and, you know, um, uh, US-based connections actually led to really high caliber investors coming into Pakistan over the last few years, right? Even those who were not investing outside of U US. So first round in Kleiner, for example, you know, not exactly known as international VCs, but came in relatively early into Pakistan. Process, Tiger Global, uh, I think Sequoia is not far behind. Addition has done it, and then companies like Stripe, Visa, and Flexport. And if you go to operators, it gets even better, right? Founders of Twitter and Medium, DoorDash, Flexport, Plaid, um, you name it, like who's who of Silicon Valley, I mean, executives that have invested in Pakistan. So phenomenal uh, uh, traction so far, and then, Looking ahead, you know, I see that continue because despite all these incredible numbers, uh, we're still super early, no mega rounds, you know, um, uh, as you define them by 100 million plus rounds. And only two companies in Pakistan, actually only three companies in Pakistan at Series B still. So no Series C yet. So a lot of this growth is um, uh, in our future. So very excited about that potential too. I wanted to touch on this point and, and really I'll, I'll go to Basil and then anybody else who would like to kind of participate. You, you've got your ear on the ground all the time. You have LPs that are both regional and international. Um, one of the things that I personally picked up last year, having spoken to many clients and international investors, and I'm passionate about as magnet as well, selfishly, is that when we start seeing this activity of a KKR making an investment, a first round in Pakistan, they then begin to look at the rest of the region and that part of the geopolitical friction historically of specific countries begins to go away when you look holistically at a wider region and dedicating resources to look at more geographies. As you said personally, Pakistan, Nigeria, Egypt, they're, they're three different areas. 
what is the talk of the town internationally? And if we just look at numbers, 45% of investors in MENA-based companies come from outside of the region. That is a record for the region. What are they saying and what is the talk um, over the last year and their view of this wider region? Yeah. First of all, I just want to say congratulations to Atif. I think we sat on a panel a year ago and said, this is the year of Pakistan. And I think he made it happen. So, you know, <laughs> really, um, really great, great work that happened there and, and, and kudos to you. Um, listen, we're proud that half of our investors in our funds are international investors, including a lot of institutions in the US and Europe. That took us a while to get them over the line because they see a lot of, you know, risk, if you like, and, and they, they assess that. So I agree with you, once you start to kind of show the picture of inter other international investors, especially people getting more and more comfortable with investing in the region, it creates a certain momentum and that momentum is definitely accelerating. So undoubtedly, I think we'll see more international investors in, you know, coming in this year, I believe, again, everything kind of caveated with, let's see what happens to the global equity and debt market in general. So that's, you know, that's something that I think we all have to be cognizant. There is some sort of correction potentially looming um, and how long that lasts. But if you take that caveat aside for a second, the momentum is there, the acceleration is there. The challenge still remains that we don't have good stories to tell. And I think, you know, we, we still have, we have one or two examples of an IPO and a SPAC here and a, and a big round there and an exit here. But to be honest, those stories are, are, are still, you know, um, I don't wanna say far and few between, but they're not enough to create enough justification in some of those investors' mind to put in big money and not know if they're gonna be able to take it out. And the kind of, please believe me story, this is, going to happen it's happening i don't know how out of did it with pakistan but it seems to not work elsewhere let's put it that way i mean people are cautious especially as they get to the series b and c and there's bigger tickets to to write and they don't believe that an exit the only exits they have would be a big buyer or an ipo right there isn't a secondaries market where you can kind of trade some smaller you know investments from seed into series a or something like that that being said the definition of the region changes depending on investors. European investors look at Africa. American investors kind of look at Africa, Pakistan, and GCC. Asian investors look at other, um, you know, uh, certain geographies that, that they're interested in. A lot of Africa, there's a lot of Japanese in Africa, a lot of Chinese in Africa, and then kind of moving north into North Africa. So you have to be careful which investor you're talking to or referring to. The last thing I'll say to you though, and, th and this is important, for investors coming from Asia in particular, they don't see Middle East as one region. They see it as a lot of countries and they see that as complexity, right? So telling the story about, oh, but I have 300 million people in MENA and or, you know, if I include Pakistan, then, you know, it's a billion people or whatever the numbers are, doesn't sit necessarily resonate well because in Asia, they, the lesson was learned that if you're Indonesia going to Malaysia, it's not that simple, right? Or if you're Malaysia going into Singapore, it's not that simple. Every market has its idiosyncrasies. For the companies do that are able to show more than one country execution, I think the valuation bump okay. is significant. So if and you're in UAE and Saudi, it's very different than being just in Saudi. Sorry. I, so I want to jump back to Atif on this point because it's one of the questions I was going to come to later, but if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you now. We have not seen necessarily, and correct me if I'm wrong, you mentioned too many Pakistani startups scaling beyond Pakistan. And if we are all saying and recognizing, if we want to see these big exits, that scale is the name of the game to go beyond the markets, do we anticipate that activity? At the same time, we have begun to see some acquisition activity and interest of regional startups entering Pakistan. So what's your view on this cross-pollination of what is a massive market, 220, 30 million people, opportunity, et cetera? But from your investment perspective, will is it Pakistan first, Pakistan only, or is it beyond markets and what do you see in terms of the the, the investor and uh, sure. startup activity coming in sure so first of all let me say it's just so many people who have made this happen you know like so much had to come together uh, uh, it always uh, it takes that um so look that's one thing that Pakistan is going for it that, you know, none of the other GCC countries, maybe Egypt comes a bit close, but it's such a massive country, 220 million people. 
Uh, so it's a very large market. You can build really large outcomes in Pakistan. We truly believe that. Um, and we're very happy, you know, like funding startups that are just focused on Pakistan. Uh, and there's just the land grab happening because you're still at two to 3% uh, of consumer spending being online. And as that goes to 15 to 20%, you have, you know, tens of billions of dollars in annual, uh, uh, you know, spending and potentially like 100 billion plus in enterprise value to be created in Pakistan. That said, you know, um, you have some extremely ambitious founders, right? And especially with the newer business models, we saw this with ride hailing, for instance, that, you know, like if you figured out the formula, then go and grab as much land as possible across countries and, you know, like you're bigger as a result. So we're seeing the same happen in quick commerce. Uh, Airlift, for instance, already went to South Africa. They expanded that. Uh, uh, in fact, the founding team, like they flew, uh, three days after announcing their Series B. So they had already their sites and plans on what the next market is. They went in very quickly and that's scaling very nicely. Um, so I feel we'll continue seeing that, you know, like in the new business models, people will try to move quickly and that's what's driving some of the acquisitions you mentioned. Um, so in EdTech, for instance, you know, above buying uh, uh, EdMatrix and then trucker buying uh, truck share in Pakistan. Um, so uh, I think we'll see that in both directions. Retail is expanding into Saudi as well, uh, but I don't think like that has to be a given, right? For Pakistani startups, uh, you'll see a lot of Pakistani startups become really big, really successful by just staying focused in their core market. Okay, cool. Before we come on to the customary predictions from each of you, if there's anyone who has any questions please put them in the chat or in the Q&A so that we can ask them in uh, five minutes. But um, Amal and Dina, um, to end this out, we touched upon exits. Um, we've seen Fauri list in Egypt. We've seen Jahiz now in Saudi, as Basil mentioned. We've seen some SPACs, but in the reality, 35 exits in MENA, a record high up from 31 in 2019, is hardly many liquidity offense for investors who've been around some seven, 10 plus years. What do we anticipate needs to happen for an acceleration of some of this activity? And do you believe that we will see more? So two questions, one, the catalyst, and two, what do we believe uh, needs to happen to see more of these regional, well, number one, do we see a benefit in the regional listings? And two, do we anticipate more of that happening? And again, afterwards, if Basil and Artif, from your perspectives, would like to share, but maybe Amal first and then Dina, and then if anybody would like to share before we jump into predictions. So I'm sure. Go for it. Go ahead. So I actually just want to start by saying that I might disagree a little with Basil, is that I actually see that international investors is their view on the region is actually quite the opposite. They actually do lump us up. They lump us up as the Middle East. Um, and there are very few um, discerning international investors that understand the intricacies of the variances across the region and, and how the opportunity is different. And it's only the ones that come to the region that then really see that sort of map of how the ecosystem looks and how the opportunity is different in each country um, in, 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 in our region, be it the Middle East, North Africa, or extended into Africa and, and also Pakistan um, and Turkey. And so I actually think this knowledge is now starting to sort of be acquired by international investors. And I see that's how the, the in, in the coming years sort of acquisitions or mergers or consolidations are going to happen because I feel like there's a lot of, uh, there's the sort of prototyping of one, one international investor thinking that every country is Saudi or every country is Egypt or every country is the UAE and not realizing that no, the opportunities are quite different. Um, and once that happens, I think, the movement towards acquisitions to get exposure to that market will change. And so, for example, we had a harmonica that was bought um, out of Latsix Labs 18 months in because Match.com realized that rather than reinvent the wheel of trying to sort of create that product that targets the cultural, the, the more conservative cultures, why don't we just get something that's already on board? And I think we'll, we'll see a lot more of that as the international players come on board. The other something I feel is that we keep calling it cross-pollination, but I, I feel like we, we just forget that the US 
similar to to what Bessel was saying is actually the actually the opposite of what he's saying about Africa. We tend to talk about Africa as a country, and we also speak about U.S. as, as a country. But yeah, the U.S. is really a continent, and so the cross pollination was also happening. And very early in the game, U.S. companies would expand into Europe, which is a market they understand, and that's exactly the same as what we're seeing now. It's more about how do we go into similar opportunities into into terrains that are very similar to ours from an entrepreneurship perspective. And I think that's why we're going to the Africa, the Pakistan, because the products that are built here or built within the region are sort of have a higher sort of viability or need within similar markets versus saying, let's go to the US. And, and so I think this was always inevitable. Um, and, and I see a lot more of, of I see a lot more IPOs happening. Um, and, and even though, in the grand scheme of things, Flatix Hubs has been in the region for the last uh, 10 years. All of our existing funds have actually only launched end of 2017. And VC has always been a long-term game. I mean, we always go, and, and I'm sure Bessel would agree, and, and everyone here would agree, you go to an, an, an LP and, and say, don't expect your money back before seven to eight years. Um, and, and, and so I feel like in, the, in light of us understanding the long-term nature of VC, we're actually doing, maybe I'm the optimist now, but but I feel like we're doing so much better than, than we could have. And there's that cycle. I always say an ecosystem, and that's my closing remark. I always say an ecosystem is self-feeding. You can only call ourselves an ecosystem if naturally there's money chasing opportunity. And because there's money, there's more opportunity. And then this keeps self-feeding into itself and the stakeholders come in and, and the opportunists come in. And I feel like this is organically now happening versus before where it had to be pushed by governments. Okay, I'm on. Shortly, I think there's something exciting about looking into all of the regions that we've been talking about. So when you talk about, Mina, you talk about Pakistan, you talk about Turkey, you talk about all the African countries here together, right? And then having that visibility and show the connectivity, you know, and, you know, the activities that happen across countries as well. That is one part of the story that could create the excitement to see, you know, a much bigger market that could allow these startups, you know, to scale and to grow and to look into talents, because we talk about talents sometimes every time, right? But if I'm able to go and we're looking at multiple companies that are working, for example, in expanding to Pakistan, right? But the talent is from there as well. So I think portraying and going back to Basel's point on portraying a story, right? Maybe it's the stories of, you know, all these companies and all of the mega kind of investments, but also the story of the region, you know, and what are the potential and the possibilities that can happen over time and which funds and why funds are looking at multiple ones and not just, you know, the Middle East or not just the GCC, but are looking at all of those because that will happen and it is already happening. I think the other point about, you know, what we're seeing in terms of Jahez and Faudi, that actually goes back into showing that positivity. Many companies now are looking at different events of exits, right? Is it only one? No, it doesn't have to be that only one that everybody has been talking about for the past years. You know, I have to just, you know, IPO here or there, but now you're seeing different events. Again, that is a positive, you know, kind of sign that we need to also show, maybe that's our role also at an early stage to show the different types of exits that could possibly happen. We're also seeing many acquisitions, right, that are happening in the region. So is it the year of collaboration? Is it the year that founders will start looking at other companies and say, we're together, you know, stronger, you know, and how can we do it? I think there's a lot of questions, you know, around that, but we hopefully see more of these kind of, you know, putting hands together, you know, between the startups and the founders as well. Thank you. Vasil Atif, anything quickly to comment on that before we jump into predictions? I know, uh, yeah, predictions and questions. I'll do it very quick. I ask the founders a, a question often, and it's always interesting to see them answer it. As I said, would you rather own 10% of a $100 million company or 1% of a billion dollar company? Right? And, 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 and the point of that question is the answer is they're both equal. But achieving one and achieving another are very different uh, outcomes, if that makes sense, right? Um, you know, the time, the effort, the probability, the risks, the competition, because if you're doing well, you're by definition attracting competition into your space. You only have to look at Kutopi and then look at how many cloud kitchens we have now. And it was only three <laughs> years ago that that business started, right? Um, but the point being is there should be more exits. They should happen earlier. They should be combined, and there's lots of different thoughts about, you know, companies in Egypt and Nigeria come 
to create value or Saudi and Egypt. There's lots of different things, or it could be product lines. You do morning deliveries. I do evening deliveries. Let's put it together. You do last mile. I do first mile, put it together. There's all sorts of ideas. Value can be created through acquisitions. If people can put aside their egos and understand that 10% of a hundred is just the same as 1% of a billion. And that getting to a billion requires a lot of effort, work, dilution, dilution, and dilution in terms of raising capital and all the time that goes there. That's my view, Thank it's you. my personal view. And I wish to see more of that happening in the short term. Artif? Um, look, I think you have to keep the faith. Uh, this, this is the process. I think exits will come if great companies get well, there is plenty of capital in the world. And I think like one thing, um, you know, again, Mina relative to Pakistan, Mina had a lot of local capital come in that thinks differently. I think expectations are different. And Pakistan anchored itself to US capital early in their cycle. And I think like that played to an advantage, it's much faster moving capital. Um, and a lot of that is not mandate driven. No US VC has a Pakistan mandate, you know, or Africa mandate, right? Like it's, it's just that open to doing interesting opportunities. And a lot of that is relationship driven. So I think being opportunistic, uh, building those relationships and going for that. And that then opens up the US market for these startups as well. And we hope to see a lot more companies from the region actually um, IPOing in the US public markets. Thank you. Right, predictions. If we can keep them short, quick fire, three each, and we'll be uh, writing that up. If I can start with Atif, Amal, Basil, Dina. All right. I'll, I'll go first. So first one, what I mentioned, attack of the accelerators. Uh, I think we'll see a lot more accelerators, you know, uh, investing very, very heavily uh, in the region uh, across the board. Uh, and I think seed investors have to prepare for that and have a strategy for it. Uh, number two, Pakistan uh, in 2022 will exceed 600 million in VC funding and end up being, uh, you know, like one sixth relative to VC funding in MENA. So continue to make close that gap. Uh, and then the third one is uh, this year is going to be not like last year. Uh, we will have a downturn. We are seeing public markets, tech multiples have compressed. Uh, they'd start bleeding over to stage rounds first and then earlier stage as well. So maybe we'll have next, you know, like uh, six months. It's going to be interesting to watch, probably a slowdown. Uh, but the later on, strong back. Cool. Thank you. I'm out. I think more doubling down on the region. We'll see for many, you know, that will happen this year, hopefully. Uh, I think in terms of sector, I would love to look, you know, into the fintech, what we're seeing in, you know, previously was mostly a lot of payment companies. I think there will be more around, you know, data and artificial intelligence and digging deeper, you know, into the possibilities of fintech and more collaborative approaches between corporates, you know, and startups, hopefully also in that uh, front. And maybe uh, the last one is basically, um, you know, a lot of and more consumer behaviors shift. So a lot of the existing companies will have to look into new needs, new demands, new shifts, you know, than the technologies. And with Web3, I'm seeing a lot of companies introducing, you know, solutions and NFTs and crypto. So I think we will see some crypto funds, maybe. Let's see who's going to do it first, you know, in the region. Or focus, maybe it could be a subcomponent. I can, tell, I can tell you that the race is on. Um, you can't, <laughs> you won't, I, I can already know who's filing on those. Um, and I think that's my first prediction. I think this craze on Web3, for a lot of entrepreneurs, it's going to feel a little bit disheartening because investors are fickle and we like to look at trends and things like that. So, so there'll be a lot of attention paid to Web3, unfortunately, because I'm still trying to understand it. And if that makes me sound like a dinosaur, then I'm a dinosaur. Uh, but I don't know what people are buying and selling on those platforms. But Web3, I think, is going to be big. I think we clear $4 billion easily, Philip easily this year. Um, I was going to say five and then I'm like, I don't want to lose the bet to Philip, so I'll say four. Um, so I think we clear four billion. I think it will be made up of the same thing, which is these mega rounds, 100, 200 million. We'll see a couple of three, four hundred million dollar rounds that will anchor the kind of the base of the first billion or a billion and a half. And then I think the rest is just capital pouring in. My last prediction for you is and this isn't necessarily good news for, for local investors but, um, or regional investors like ourselves, or let me put it this way. It, 
needs us to think a little bit about our, our positioning. And that's definitely something that we've been thinking through. But global international investors are coming in. I mean, the number of people on the ground now, whether it's you know Sequoia, GFC, um, Lightspeed, there's a whole bunch. And I'm talking specifically GCC, but they cover kind of MENA from there. Some of them, I guess, will cover Pakistan or they already covered Pakistan out of you know better. But my point being is they're here and they're looking to write tickets that are more substantial, which is great for the startups, but it also means they'll crowd out some of the regional VCs. And so regional VCs have to kind of rethink a little bit positioning and stage and, and value add. And I think good cap tables should have both on it, regional and international VCs. I think that's the right way to go, but it will be some interesting dynamics over the course of the year. Thank you. And Dina, last but not least. So I, I, I think I would have to second Bessel. Maybe I'd be courageous and say above 4 billion uh, next year. I, I, think the, I think the pressure on valuations, on, unfortunately, is going to continue for, a, for into 2022, though, though I do expect a bit of a correction towards the end of the year um, after many of those mega deals have sort of shown themselves to the market. I personally see uh, an attention to agri-tech uh, in 2022, I, I think it's becoming a hot topic in terms of water and consumption and, and everything else. And also, I think a, a huge topic that would come into play next year is generally climate resilience is going to be something that would uh, seek attention. Um, and uh, fintech, I see a lot of consolidation. So I think there's been a, a huge sort of spur in terms of number of investments. I think 2022 might see some consolidation on, on many of those that have raised uh, impressive rounds and definitely just a change, in the, a, a change in the definitions. And so I think the definition of seed investments and Series A and Series B is probably going to have an uphaul in, in 2022. Great, cool. Thank you very much. I'm going to go to questions. Um, SPACs and IPOs. Is this likely to accelerate this year, or are we just going to see more traditional M&A activity uh, and consolidation? There's stuff happening. I mean, Egypt's lined up, lined up a bunch. Abu Dhabi is lined up a bunch. So locally, definitely. Yeah. Globally, hard to tell, honestly, because it's such a mixed bag. There are so many SPACs that are not able to find targets for some reason. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm not familiar enough to be able to give you a good understanding of kind of the, the complexities of that, if, if you like, um, um, Philip. But what I will say is this, and, and I kind of wanted to mention earlier, but now it makes sense to, to bring it up here. I like the fact that Gehez is coming, you know, IPOing, and, and, and if you think Faudi, and then the other ones, because they actually create platform technology businesses. So others can plug into them and can be acquired and built on top of it, right? So one of the kind of things that's opening up now is these, you know, Gehez is not just a delivery platform, one of the largest in Saudi, but it also will expand through acquisitions and others, I, I presume, right? I don't know, but I presume. Faudi is already looking at certain things and doing relationships and partnerships. So it, it I wish more companies would come to those markets and have access to, um, let's call it a cheaper capital pool to be able to do those acquisitions. Pakistan, uh, sorry, out of Pakistan. Are we going to see any of this type of activity or just way too far off to be seeing anything? Uh, it's, it's way too early, I think, uh, for exits for Pakistan. So not this year. More acquisitions from regional players of Pakistani startups or potentially Pakistani startups acquiring uh, into Africa or other areas? Uh, so I think there might be some consolidation, especially in a space like quick commerce, where you know you have coalitions uh, or you acquire companies to expand into regions. Uh, we might see that, but short of that, uh, the acquisitions even we saw uh, the ones I mentioned, uh, you know, that Abwab and Trucker did. They're more like you know acquiring a team to Acquire expand. Higher. So it's not really an exit um, acquire exactly. Um, so we might see more of that. Uh, but we are excited to just continue building for now. And I think like uh, exits are, you know, three to four years away. Amal, Dina, government focus, government And exits and exits, Atif. And <laughs> exits and exits. Don't be, don't be mean. And exits and exits. Sometimes for a lot of money, sometimes not. But an exit and exit. <laughs> no, no. But uh, what I mean is like the kind of. No, I know, get it. I get half it. Half a billion, it. billion. That's that's way out. The but future, I don't yeah. think we should not call them exits. I'm just. I'm sorry. I'm going to harp on this point. I think some companies need to realize, and if they realize it early, I think even all the better to them. Listen, I can't scale. I'm not going to be able to do it. Instead of you know raising money and wasting it, mm -hmm. do the exit. 
pass on the baton and move on to your next one. Oh, right? sure, and, sure. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think those founders really hats off to them. If they do that, they can build momentum around their career, their experience, and get it right eventually, as opposed to holding on to a business that just isn't going to make it. Yeah, just to be clear, in this case, I think these businesses were not even like six months old. So, so this was a very different a strategic alignment of saying, rather than do it our own, own let's you know ally and do it together and there's nothing wrong with that but i think it's very different outcome from having built a company and then you know like actually i get it um, no fair enough fair point dina Dina and amal um from uh your perspectives whether it's africa egypt or or saudi is this the year that we're going to see any big revolutionary changes from a government perspective to spur on kind of um entrepreneurship in any geographies and maybe even artif and basel afterwards from a uae or or Pakistan perspective? I mean, in magic wand, is there something that we would like to see governments doing in 2022? So I feel like I, I can speak mostly on, on Egypt. I think there's, there is a huge effort to try and spur from government to spur entrepreneurship. It's been there for a while. I think the biggest part of it is legislation, which I think we have a long way to go on. Uh, maybe FinTech now, Bessan and I were having a conversation, is, is, seem, is seeming to take the, the most attention in terms of how do we help that and it's because it's a huge need um, in terms of us being able to sort of bring everyone into the into the, the economic uh, circle. So I, I feel like Egypt definitely has that. Um, not yet can't speak much about sub-Saharan Africa, but I think in Egypt and North Africa, definitely governments are very interested to remove hurdles. I think, yeah, becoming a hub for entrepreneurs and startup will require that because that's the only way you can have startups stay, you know, in a certain place and really flourish and bring other startups and excite the others. So I think it has to happen if these sectors will start because I see here a lot of questions around, you know, NFTs and about, you know, all of these stuff, how the regulations are going to be. It's obviously there is, you know, hurdles, but still we have to know that as, you know, Dina said, you know, Fentex is a need, then that's why, you know, governments actually moved fast and tried to regulate it so quickly creating sandboxes and all of that and it happened in Saudi Arabia as well heavily with so many of the companies you know where the sandbox started to roll out all these companies but I think it's about also keeping up with the technology evolution as well so we see that there is so many groups that are looking into tech and trying to keep up so I do expect to see a lot of these regulations happening uh, not sure about the speed but there is a lot of definitely groups that are looking into that and lobbying from the private sector, you know, to work collaboratively with the government sector so they can inform about what's happening, like different associations, I think in different regions. So I do expect, you know, some acceleration that happens over there, but uh, not sure if it will keep up, you know, with how tech is moving super fast as well. Look, I'm conscious of time. There's only a couple of minutes left. Um, a last question that I'd like to ask, and anyone can answer it, or all of you. Uh, valuations bubble, and is it likely to burst in 2022, or do we need to stay positive? You can talk Pakistan, Egypt, UAE, whichever way you like. I think it's a little bit of both. Um, but I think it's also natural of markets to have bubbles and correct. I don't think in the grand scheme of things, the overall market is in a bubble. I think there are certain pockets. Um, they might, they might self-correct this year. They might correct in, in, a, in the following year. Uh, but I, I feel like overall the positivity is more towards seeing an opportunity. Um, maybe there's a sudden rush, but, but I, I don't feel like the entire ecosystem is going through a bubble. Altif for Pakistan. I think... So, so I think globally, too, we'll see a lot of pressure on valuations. You know, uh, the fundamental reason the valuations, you know, like uh, expanded so much was that public markets actually uh, were uh, giving very high multiples to tech companies. Right. And, and since that's compressed and ultimately that's what drives this, we should see that flow into, um, you know, our ecosystems as well, especially the companies that are raising CDCD rounds. Uh, and, you know, they're still figuring out, you know, their path to profitability. I think they're going to be the most impacted. Now at seed, I think it's not multiple, it's more supply and demand driven. And one of the things in relationship to Pakistan we've seen is that, uh, in fact, like Pakistan now has the worst ratio in terms of under half a million deal sizes, right? Uh, down to 29% when most of the region is 45. And the reason that happened is because it just moved so quickly, you know, uh, there were lots of opportunities for great teams to go and build. And they raised that, you know, like starting rounds were like a million, million and a half. 
Uh, I think like that will change as well. Like we'll, we'll start seeing a lot more true proceed, pre-seed going forward. Message? I have no sympathy for investors who pay for high valuations. I mean, seriously, if they get a hit, they get hit. And we have paid certain valuations that we thought were exorbitant and, you know, enter, and, and ultimately the, um, the entrepreneurs or the companies outperformed it. My point this is this, the valuation isn't a question for investors. The valuation for me has always been a question for founders. When you set your valuation high, all you're doing is raising the bar of expectations of your performance over the coming period. And if that's what you want to do because it makes you feel good and because you get to hire, put a plaque and says, I raised that 70 million or I raised that 200 million or whatever, be my guest. But the expectations with higher valuations and multiple wise means that you're going to have to perform higher. It creates a risk and nobody wants to see a downturn. I had the fortune or unfortunate to work during Internet 1.0 bubble crisis. I'll tell you this, investors made more money after the crisis than before it because the, we were able to go around and clean up on companies and invest in them and pick up assets for a lot cheaper because they had you know, set the valuation so high and down rounds are painful. So I don't have a sympathy for the investors. I just think entrepreneurs need to think very carefully how they set valuations versus their performance. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna end it there, but I'm gonna end it as a call to action to all of you to share the valuations with Magnet because I believe <laughs> if we do not have the transparency <laughs> of valuations, it is very difficult for founders and investors alike to be educated on the impact of them because it'll always be a black box and a Pandora's box that nobody has information around. So uh, it's an open call, it's an open challenge. I'd love to work with each and every one of you, but I believe that the transparency around that and better educating the founders and investors alike will better support people in making informed decisions in what is a very opaque market. But Thank you very much, each of you individually, collectively. I always enjoy these discussions. Uh, I'm sure we could have gone on for much more time, but uh, thank you very much for everybody that's attended. Uh, wishing you all the best for 2022 uh, for your institutions and personally, uh, please stay safe. If you come down to the DIFC, we've just moved to DIFC, please uh, come swing by and say hi. And um, we look forward to seeing you all very soon. Thank you very much and uh, uh, all the best. Thank you all. Thanks, Bye-bye. Thank Bye. Bye.